Okay, so welcome to the afternoon session. This is the uh, fourth, right? Yes. Fourth lecture by Gerhard. Right, so <coughs> I promised we're going to prove Grayson's theorem. <coughs> so, suppose gamma zero from S1 into R2 is an embedded curve Let's assume it's smooth, but the theorem extends to even continuous curves. Suppose this is an embedded curve, then closed curve, then <coughs> the flow DDT of gamma PT equals curvature vector. And since there's only one geodesic curvature, I write um, this is uh, kappa, and uh, this is now, instead of mean curvature flow, uh, people call it the curve shortening flow. But it is, of course, mean curvature flow. <coughs> has uh, a smooth solution on some finite time interval. Max. This one we knew before. Any such flow has a smooth solution on some maximal time interval, but the point is that this thing becomes, if it is embedded to start with, it will remain embedded. Carlo showed you that in his last lecture. It will remain embedded, <coughs> and in fact, it will eventually become convex. will become convex for some zero less than t naught less than t max and uh, then contract smoothly to a point and uh, the rescaling is uh, the rescalings that I showed you last time will be exactly the round shrinking uh, spheres or circles um, which were our main example of a type 1 singularity. So I just write the word round. It's a round point. In the end, it looks like a circle. Now, this was a big sort of result at the time. Because, you know, you could think of a possible, people were thinking of a counter example. They thought if they s start with an initial curve like this, then since this initial curve is uh, contained in this circle here, and it has to remain inside this shrinking circle, and we know this big red circle dies at the time R0 squared over 2. Uh, the other curve must develop a singularity in this fixed time. And you could have drawn your initial curve, gamma 0, of course, much more wild than I did. Instead of three turns, I could have done three trillion turns, and still the theorem of Grayson says this thing unwinds in a time less than R0 squared over 2, becomes convex, and shrinks to a point. The reason is, of course, that this works is the more thin you make these spirals, the bigger the curvature gets at this tip, and the larger the speed is. So uh, the more you try to construct your counterexample, the faster the thing invites. <laughs> and uh, the way uh, Grayson proved this was a very beautiful, intricate analysis 
of the number of turning points on this, uh, where, where kappa changes its sign, and he showed this is monotonically decreasing, and he kept sort of track of the pieces in between, and eventually he could show that no singularities develop before this happens. Now, with the technology that has been built up since then, monotonicity formula rescaling techniques, I want to show you uh, that one can attack this slightly differently. So <coughs> let's do a proof <coughs> or a sketch of proof in the following way. We know because T max, you know, because of this circle around there, there will be a finite time singularity. So we know there is a <coughs> blow up of curvature. This is one of the very first theorems I proved. There's a blow up of curvature as T approaches T max. Because T max is finite. And it's finite because this thing is enclosed by the circle. So we know the curvature blows up. Then we can use our rescaling procedure. There's only two possibilities. Either it's type 1 or it's type 2. So A, suppose it is of type 1. Now if it is of type 1, then we can use the monotonicity formula. So then using the theorem coming out of the monotonicity formula, we conclude that <coughs> that this singularity can be rescaled to a self-similar shrinking solution. Arising out of a solution which satisfied kappa equals position vector times the normal. But this, in the one-dimensional case, these were classified. These are only the Arbre-Schlanger curves. Arbre-Schlanger-Mullin curves. And they are not. There's just this one. And there's this one, and a one-parameter family, which are all immersed. But we already know from what Carlo told us that embedded remains preserved. So in the limit after rescaling, the worst that could happen is a curve that touches itself, but not a curve which is intersecting itself. So these guys are not allowed as possible limiting curves. So this is the only one that remains. But if this is the uh, rescaling of the singularity, then obviously the theorem is true. So in this case, we are done. So all we have to do now is to rule out that there is no type 2 singularity. So B, step B, we have to <coughs> rule out type 2 singularity, and then we are done. Because then, if this cannot happen, then it must have been case A, and it is this circle, and we are done. Right? That's the structure of the proof. The thing that is remaining is to rule out the type 2 singularity. Now, the thing, now it turns out, I already showed you the picture, you can show, and I'm not going to do this part, can show that <coughs> we can rescale to an eternal solution. That part I showed you last time. So some gamma infinity on minus infinity less than t less than plus infinity. And this is convex and translating. Convex and translating. This part I 
takes a little bit of time. It's not too hard, but I skip that part. You can show that this eternal solution that you get must have a sign on the curvature, and it is in fact a translating solution. And a, <coughs> and a translating solution means it solves also an ODE like this. But this time it's not scaling in direction f, but it is translating in direction of some vector R2. Right, so there's some translation direction and the curvature has to be just the inner product of the normal and this translating direction and then it is moving with speed one in direction of omega. And this can easily be solved. And what you get is the Grim Reaper curve. Minus log cosine of x plus t. So it translates in this direction. Right, so you have to do this rescaling procedure. You have to do, show that it's convex translating, satisfies this equation, and then it must be this curve because that ODE can be easily solved. Of course, it could be a rescaling of this curve. But if we rescale it to make the curvature equal to one at this tip here, then um, we get exactly this picture. So we now have to rule this out, that this picture occurs, ever occurs. That's going to be hard because this picture can occur. If the curve gamma is just immersed. Remember, I've drawn this picture here. <coughs> of a immersed curve, which develops a cusp. And then this cusp here, OK, we'll go the other direction. That doesn't matter. Under the microscope, it will give exactly this picture. So this picture, it does appear in terms of curve shortening flow. This means there is no chance that I can use the evolution equation on quantities of the curve, like DDT kappa, DDT gradient kappa, DDT kappa double dot, in order to rule out this picture. Because these equations for kappa don't care whether it's an immersed curve or not an immersed curve. So I have to bring in the ambient structure. I have to use the thing is embedded. And to rule out these pictures, I have to use the embeddedness in a quantitative way. And this is what is called a non-collapsing estimate. So I have to prove a quantitative version of embeddedness is preserved. You know, Carlo showed you that embeddedness is preserved, but I need it more precisely. I need a quantitative version of the preservedness of embeddedness. And this is called a non-collapsing estimate. Non-collapsing means, usually for minimal surfaces, people have used this expression, they don't have sheets coming together. And this was, you know, if this picture happens, after all this uh, Grey Reaper looks like this, this means you have two sheets of the curve coming arbitrarily close together compared to the length of the curve. This is collapsing. So this Grim Reaper 
that's how it's called, Grim Reaper. Again, Richard Hamilton's notation, Grim Reaper curve. And um, the theoretical physicists actually have also studied this because it's related to quantum field theories. So they called it the pa uh, paper clip. Somehow different, different associations in the different communities. Paperclip is uh, collapsing. Mm. Well, looks like a, look, uh, if you open the paperclip, right? <laughs> it didn't know, it didn't know that? No. <laughs> Usually I have to explain why people call it the Grim Reaper. <laughs> The, the, the Grim Reaper is because if something, some curve lives in here, it has to die before the thing passes through. Right? <laughs> yes. Well, there's also a Grim Reaper moving to the left, like in this picture. It depends on where you. Okay, but it's not really. It's not. No, not at all. No, it's a complete isometry. It's a complete isometry. It's not changing. So he heals the car in the sense that it's going to... Yes. And this, you see, the, the actual curvature flow, this flow here, right? The actual, the, the points, okay. the points, of course, move, this point moves like that. This, this point moves like this, this point moves like that, and this point moves like, ah, not very good at drawing this. So a, a little moment later, it looks like this, right? So this point has moved here, and this point has moved there, and this point has moved here, and this point has moved there. When you really follow the normal flow, but if you do an appropriate tangential diffeomorphism, then the point moves there. Right. Yes. Yes. Yes, but usually, you know, say in this curve case, of course, you cannot put the thing into a slab because the curve moves out here, right? So only asymptotically, the limit ends up in this slab, right? In this picture here, and also you can see here that the blow-up rate is higher than in the, uh, then in the um, uh, type one case, the blow up rate being higher means that just before the singularity, the speed is much higher. So this must mean that before the singularity, the surface is further away, right? Because at the end, it's extremely fast, faster than the other singularity. So if I were to take this middle point here, just, you know, the singular point, and rescale, like I did in the previous case, I would, because this is moving in more slowly, it has a higher blow-up rate, but it is moving in more slowly because at the end it is so incredibly fast, I would just blow this out to infinity. We wouldn't get a limit. Yes. Okay. No? That's, that's, that, that's what, what one has to sort of intuitively think. And now we have, right, so and now we want to show that this is never happening. So we want to show that this uh, collapsing doesn't happen. <coughs> so the, the idea is to look at the following quantity. Consider, I mean, there's not so many geometric quantities around on this curve after all, right? How many, how many quantities are there on the curve that you could consider, <coughs> right? So. What I do is, suppose I have a point P here and a point Q there. What I do is, I look at D, a function on S1 cross S1 cross my time interval to R, and I take another function called L from S1 cross S1 cross time interval to R, 
And one of them, d of p of q and t, is simply the distance in Euclidean space. That's how I bring in Euclidean space. So this is just the distance between f of q and t minus f of p and t. And the other quantity I can come up with is L, which is the length along the curve. So L is simply this piece here. So this is the integral from p to q uh, ds. And ds is the arc length parameter with respect to the curve at time t. And <coughs> the idea is to control the ratio of d and l. So notice that the global maximum maximum of d divided by l is of course when d uh, is just as big as l and um, uh, by triangle inequality and uh, that would be 1 is 1. And also on the diagonal of course uh, <coughs> if the two points come close together if it's a smooth curve it is equal to this maximum value. So also on the diagonal of S1 cross S1, when P equals Q, uh, we have uh, D divided by L is equal to 1. The limit makes sense if it's a smooth curve. So now the amazing theorem is, which comes out, is that D over L can never get a new local minimum under curve shortening flow. It's a while back, don't remember. <coughs> the quotient D over L can not attain a new local minimum. This now for closed curves, this is this is already good enough. If you look at <coughs> this, is, this <coughs> this would already rules out. <coughs> so remark. This already rules out type 2 singularities type 2 singularities on <coughs> uh, on uh, on uh, open curves Say if you have something like this, okay, on curves like this, because as you go to infinity, certainly d over l, sort of cone-like, uh, is bounded uh, from below. So d over l would be bigger than some epsilon as long as these two lines are not parallel. So if d over l is bigger than some epsilon, there's always some x because the interior part is compact, right? So you can always find, because both d and l are positive, you can find some infimum in the compact part at near infinity, certainly because it's sort of like a wedge. Uh, you get this lower bound, and then you can show near infinity the behavior remains, and therefore there can never be any type 2 singularity because if we were to rescale the type 2 singularity, we know we get this. But on this guy, D compared to L 
is as small as we want. Okay? You can make it below epsilon, no matter what the epsilon is. And uh, doing the calculation, I also tell you what to do for a closed curve, but to show you the actual calculation, which I think is quite uh, uh, nice, uh, it's easier to just look at d over L. So the, the proof is sort of in the spirit that uh, Carlo already explained. Now, <coughs> these, are, uh, these are smooth functions away from the diagonal. I only have to check points away from the diagonal because on the di diagonal I'm on the global maximum anyway. So I, on, away from the diagonal this is smooth. So the infimum of d over L is a Lipschitz function in, in T and therefore I, it is enough to control the derivative at a local minimum and show it's greater or equal to zero. Just show that ddt of d over l at p q t zero is greater or equal to zero at a local minimum of d over l at uh, p naught t naught uh, p naught p yeah let's call it p not to have too many indices p q t okay well let's let's just do it so <coughs> we get uh, here's the Let's draw this picture. Here's P, here's Q, and uh, DDT of um, D over L. How do we write D? Uh, D over L is equal to DDT of um, F of QT minus F of PT. Uh, divided by L, and it helps to think of this as, a, as the square to one half, all right? So let's look, give some names. This is D, and uh, the vector pointing from there to here is uh, F of Q um, T minus F of P T divided by D. So this is the vector W. And then you compute here from the uh, numerator, you get um, 1 over D times L uh, times uh, DDT of F well, we know what this is. This is the uh, um, curvature vector uh, <coughs> times this distance vector. So we get here uh, f of uh, qt minus f of pt multiplied by the speed, and the speed is q at qt minus k, sorry, k, the curvature vector, at pt. All right, I think that is right, because the one-half cancels the two, and this is just one over L times uh, omega times the difference of the two curvature vectors. And now, of course, I forgot to differentiate L here in this line, so I get um, minus uh, D over L squared times the derivative of length. But, but the derivative of length under curve shortening flow is minus, so we get a plus, 
the integral of curvature squared ds from p to q. Okay? And I have to add this in here as well, plus d over l squared integral from p to q of k squared ds. Okay, that's what we get. This is how the quotient changes. And now let's see how this fits together with the first and second variation. So the first variation, now I have to be careful, right? Because this is depending, the variation, um, I can vary P and I can vary Q. Let's assume that sort of the curve in terms of S is running this direction. So let's assume that S of Q is bigger than S of P, the arc length parameter going this way. And let um, E1 be the tangent vector of f at uh, p uh, t uh, with respect to s. So E1 is uh, this vector. And E2 is the other one, right? Okay. So I have these two tangent vectors, and I can vary, of course, both of them at the same time, but I can also vary them individually. So <clears throat> let's vary them individually. First variation, if, since the curve, since the quotient is minimized, so we have the first variation is zero in the direction where I take E1, and in the other direction I just take zero of D over L. Now, this uh, <coughs> varying d gives me um, 1 over L times uh, omega times uh, E1. And varying L, if I go in E1 direction, uh, actually, you get a minus sign here if you, if you look carefully. You get a minus sign because the P is on the right, so I get minus FP times E1. And from here, I get uh, one on minus uh, D on um, L squared times the change in the length. And the length gets, if I go in direction S, right, it goes, the speed is one, so I get um, minus one, it gets shorter, so I get a plus here. So I conclude that omega times E1 is equal to D over L. And now you do the same thing with E2. So 0 equals delta 0 plus E2. You vary at the other end and uh, you uh, conclude uh, that uh, omega times E2 is also D over L. Now, if I hadn't, didn't have the denominator L in there, of course I get zero on the right hand side, right? Because we know if we just minimize distance, then the curve will be, will be vertical on the curve. You know, we get zero on the right-hand side, but because I have the denominator, I don't get zero on the right-hand side. I get a certain specific angle, which is exactly D over L. And now I have to compute the second variation. And now the key idea comes in. You see, when we do variational problems for these geometric evolution equations, what I teach my students is just compute DDT minus Laplace of everything. And 
and see what happens on the right hand side. Right? So here you would think, okay, let's compute DDT minus Laplace, so take the second derivative on S1, Kreutz S1. Take all the second derivatives on S1 and the second derivatives on the other S1. But if you think about it, this gives you the wrong result even when you don't divide by L. Because if you here have a curve minimizing between the two curves, and you take a second variation where you combine this direction down here, take the second variation in this direction, and the second variation in that direction, okay, well, what does the curve do? It looks like that. It's going to be much longer. You're not going to get any information out of that second variation. Yeah, that's, that's, you, obviously the second variation with respect to that thing is greater than zero. It will not be sophisticated enough to prove such a theorem. The only way you get interesting information out of the second variation in this picture is you have to take the second variation here in this direction and you have to combine it with the second variation in the parallel direction. And now you get a non-trivial information because this curve is not that much bigger than the original curve. So that this is a minimum is going to tell you something about the curvature of the two curves. This picture is not going to tell you anything about the curvature of the curve. So you have to not simply sum up all the possible second variations in one and the other, but you have to take a second variation which combines the direction in this one and in this one. Okay, so how does this work out in our case? It turns out we have to be very careful. If the curve runs like this, and here is P, and here is Q, and here is E1, and here is E2, then, and here is D, then it looks like not a good idea to take a second variation in direction E1 plus E2. All right. But it seems to be a much better idea to take a second variation in direction of minus E2 and then E1, if you think of this example. So case one, and how, <coughs> case one, I, yeah, so let's, before I, I do it, let me show you the second case. So the second case would be if the curve goes like this, and here's P, and here's Q. Okay, and then E1, I mean this could be, it could be unlucky and the, and the minimum is attained in this situation. And here's E2, and here's D. And in this picture, it seems like a good idea to take E1 plus E2 rather than E1 minus E2. So we have to distinguish between this case, case 2, and this case. Well, what's the difference? The difference is that in this case, you see, we have these two conditions. E1 and E2 both have the same angle with omega. So there's exactly one condition namely that uh, E1 is equal to E2, this is this case, or is uh, parallel to E2, this is this case, and this is the case where it's not parallel, but in this case E1 plus E2 is parallel to omega. Right? If you, E1 plus E2, uh, E1 plus E2 points in this direction. Okay? Yeah. okay, so maybe maybe I do the computation in this case. So the computation, 
And it, you know, it's, a compl it's completely elementary. You do, uh, uh, we have done the computation of the first variation, right? So the first variation in uh, direction E1 plus E2 uh, turns out to be, and I'll just copy it from here. Uh, you end up with um, you end up with here we are you end up with uh, uh, the first variation is 1 on L and then here divided by D you get F of Q T minus F of PT multiplied with E2 minus E1. So, why? Right, because E2 is in going direction of F, E1 goes in direction of the derivative of P. And notice that in this case, since we are <coughs> going in this direction, actually D delta of L in this case, in direction of E1 plus E2, is actually equal to zero. The length doesn't change, right? You shorten it here, but you lengthen it there by the same amount. So the variation in this direction goes like this. And then when you compute the second variation in this direction, uh, you get, <coughs> it turns out, uh, uh, you get uh, from here, when you uh, take DDS of E2 minus E1, you get exactly the curvature vector, and this one here is the omega, the direction vector. So you get 1 over L times the uh, omega times the curvature vector in the, at QT minus the curvature vector at PT. And the other term, um, simply uh, turns out to be uh, zero because uh, if you differentiate any of the other terms, E2 minus E1 is equal to zero because uh, we are in the case where E1 is parallel to E2, but they are both uh, <coughs> uh, unit vectors. So uh, they are actually equal. I should have written E1 equals E2. So you get this. <coughs> and it turns out in case one, here the computation is uh, essentially the same. You just get a few cancellations, and you have to think of that in this case, actually the length is shortened. So delta L is equal to minus two. So you use this formula, and you use that this thing is parallel, and you get the same, you get the same answer, the same. Uh, you get zero is less than delta two is uh, equal to um, one over L times omega times the curvature vector at Q minus the curvature vector at T, at P. It's except there's one magic calculation, which of course not magic, it's supposed to be like that, and uh, <clears throat> you get the same answer, and we are done because this, term is exactly what you get. It's exactly this term. So we computed from the second variation that this term is greater or equal to zero. And this term is an integral of something positive, so this is also greater or equal to zero. Then we are done. Of course, this is a Another way to prove what Carlo proved, that the distance, you know, if I don't divide by L, I get a proof that the distance between two surfaces cannot decrease. <clears throat> so I showed you this in detail because the principle, the, the basic idea to consider a function of three variables where you have sort of a point here, a point there, 
and you have a sort of what I call a two-point maximum principle. This idea carries over to the high dimensional case. So, <clears throat> right. So, but this also computes, this completes the proof of, uh, no, no, this not yet, because this is only the case for the, for the open curve, right? So, <clears throat> I just still have to tell you what to do in the case of the closed curve. Well, in the case of the closed curve, the problem is, that the function L, the function little l, you have to start somewhere, right? If you start measuring the length L from here, you run into problems on the other side of the curve because you don't know, should I, should I count the L he around here or should I count the L around there? And then the function L will have a kink and then the argument breaks down at that point. So it turns out you have to replace L by something which acts like L and is as good as L. In fact, you find something which is even better. You find the function Psi, Psi of P, Q, T, is the function, um, no, I better, better copy this from here. You take the total length of the curve, which of course depends on T, divide by pi, and then you take the sine of um, small l pi over capital L. And now it doesn't matter from where I measure small l, because if I go one half of capital L, one half around the curve, I'm ending up as at pi over two, and if I go one half the other way around, I also end up at minus uh, pi over two, and sine has the same, same value there, so it fits together. And in fact, this function has again its maximum at the diagonal, has maximum one on the diagonal of S1 cross S1 and is identically equal to 1 on the round circle. So this quantity actually measures whether you are on the round circle or not. If you're on the round circle, it's 1 equal everywhere. If you're not on the round circle, it's less than equal than 1 somewhere. And <coughs> you can prove Exactly like this, you just have to play around a little bit more and somewhere you have to estimate this integral k squared from below by the integral of k squared using Hölder's inequality. It's all in the paper, but it's all elementary and you prove that um, d over psi cannot attain a new local minimum. And this is just as good as d over l, and it also rules out the Grim Reaper. And uh, it proves, uh, therefore, it rules out type two singularities and you get Grayson's theorems. In fact, so you have sort of even a measure how um, close you are to the, to the sphere. You have something that improves. I should say that Richard Hamilton, around the same time, came up again with another argument where he was comparing the area of this piece to the area of that piece and showed that that can be controlled. And he controlled the isoparametric ratio of the curve and that rules out the Grim Reaper just as well. So you have, for the curve, you have two different new methods compared to Grayson to prove Grayson's theorem. Is there questions? Okay. Right, so <coughs> this curve shortening 
also works in a Riemann surface, and you can also prove Grayson's theorem in Riemann surfaces that an embedded curve either shrinks to a point or gets stuck on a closed geodesic. And you can even prove the lustenich schneerelmann theorem about the three different geodesics on S2 using that. But <clears throat> what I want to emphasize now is higher dimensions. And I want to, turns out, we don't have a substitute for this theorem for an embedded surface in um, R3 or in high dimensions. So it's a completely open problem. So no known substitute for n greater than two <coughs> embedded surfaces. in a Rn plus one or in a Riemannian manifold. So it's a big open problem. But in the case I told you for positive mean curvature, there are some results. So assume now that the mean curvature is bigger than zero on the evolving hypersurfaces, so they all move in the same direction. We have already seen this is a preserved quantity of mean curvature flow. It's a good, quanti good um, a, a preserved condition. So it's a good condition. And under this extra condition, a lot of results have been shown. Um, in particular, Brian White has uh, done some beautiful work um, on this case. For example, uh, in particular, he had beautiful properties of weak solutions. And uh, he proved that the surfaces are all in the region that they flow through. They sort of optimize area. They wrap the new surface that they've come to. There's no cheaper wrapping, less area in the region that the surface has already covered than the surface at that time. So there's some minimizing property, area minimizing property for this flow, some stability property for this flow. And uh, he proved this by using the monotonicity formula. And, uh, and it combined the monotonicity formula with compactness results for weak solutions and so on, get contradiction arguments. And he could actually show that there is, in this case, no collapsing. But it was with contradiction arguments. It was um, sort of um, not quantitative. It was not really, it was saying you cannot, if you rescale a singularity, you will not see two sheets come together with the help of the monotonicity formula. But he couldn't say how far they stay apart. He just could say, you will not see them coming together. And uh, then there was some work by, um, yeah, let me, let me check the names. After all, the guys are recording these results, these lectures, so I don't want to offend anybody. So, there's a result by hmm. I know it's Suji Wang, uh, and uh, what was the second name? Like this, right? S here? Yeah. OK. Right. So, so they picked up on this result of Brian Wright and introduced a condition uh, where they said, consider the inscribed radius of MNT. 
So I have to explain the inscribed radius. Here we have sort of the inscribed diagonals. Now in higher dimensions, you were sort of looking for the, um, what Carlo called the R minus, at, but you, you look for it at each point. You don't just look globally for the radius of the biggest sphere you can stick inside, but at each point you look for the biggest sphere that you can stick inside the region which touches at that point, okay? So you have your surface, MNT is the boundary of some domain. You have some point X up here, or F of X, I should say. And then <coughs> you look at the largest sphere that you can put in. And you look at that radius, and you call this the inscribed radius at the point X. Now in largest radius of ball touching f of x from inside. Okay. And uh, <coughs> Raymond, uh, uh, Raymond Cheng and uh, Xu Jia Wang, they showed uh, that you can prove some lower bound on this inscribed radius at each point, namely they find some constant alpha divided by the mean curvature at this point. Remember, I look at the case where the mean curvature is positive. And this is a scaling invariant condition because the um, mean curvature scales like 1 over radius, so this is scaling invariant. And um, if, if you can put in a sphere, if there's, if there's little mean curvature, you hope to put in a bigger sphere, and if there's, uh, if there's a lot of mean curvature, you are content with just putting a small sphere in there. Okay? And now, but the real theorem, the beautiful theorem I want to show you is due to Ben Andrews. And Ben Andrews, I mean, they used still a very complicated proof, which I didn't even check, uh, using one of the formula and building on Brian White's work. But <coughs> Ben Andrews showed with a maximum, with a two-point maximum principle, just like I discussed for the curve case, Ben Andrews proved that if you have R in greater or equal than some alpha over H for some fixed alpha bigger than zero, initially, on the initial data of mean curvature flow, then <coughs> the inequality remains true. with the same alpha on all MNT as long as the solution remains smooth all the way up to T max. And uh, the way to prove this is uh, to actually look at one over the inscribed radius. And uh, you see here's, here, the optimal one is going to touch the surface somewhere else at some f of y at each time. And then using elementary geometry between in this triangle, just use essentially Pythagoras, and 
work out the elementary geometry and you see that 1 over r in this case is equal to a quantity that looks similar to what Carlo had on the board, except that now we have these two points, x and y, and not just one point. So it's f of x minus f of y times the normal at x, and, uh, <coughs> and everything depends also on t when the surface is moving. So here's nu of x. And you divide this by the distance between the two points on the sphere, this distance here. And you just figured out this is an elementary calculation that you get this. And this, this quantity, uh, 1 over the inverse, let's call this mu, mu of x. Well, no, let's be. So mu, mu of x is the supremum, sort of the worst that you can do with this over all the y's. Uh, here's uh, p is y. So it's the supremum of this whole thing over y that are not x. So what you have to show is that um, mu divided by h remains bounded by the same fixed constant that you started with. Yeah? So, so I have to show that mu divided by h remains bounded by a fixed Constant. So you look at the first time that you hit a new maximum for this constant. Right? So look at first time where this hits a new maximum at some p q t zero. And now you're in exactly in the same situation like in the curve shortening flow where I had the d over l. Now instead of d over l, you have mu over h. But the basic idea is the same. And again, you have to be careful when you do this about your variations because you can vary at y and at, at x and at y. So the, so the main idea, which is exactly the same as in the curve shortening case, is that you take this tangent plane and you take that tangent plane and then you use the plane, the reflection plane in between Okay, and then you use those tangents of if you if you've chosen your tangent vectors down here, the EIs, then you reflect them on the yellow plane, and this gives you the ones the EIs up here, or let's call them EJs, or EI hat. EI hat is much better. EI hat. And the whole point is that you do the second variation in this argument on the mu over h, you, you, you exploit that the second variation of this quantity mu over <coughs> h in direction of the ei and the eij and the ei hat, you have to take exactly these combinations and compute this thing here and exploit that the second variation is greater or equal to zero and then you sum the whole thing over i. And that brings in the mean curvature and allows you to compare all the things. It's a, it's a three p 
page of even five pages calculation because it's such a complicated quantity here, this, you still have to divide by H, but this is the central idea. And this is very much the same idea as in the curve shortening flow, that you have to pick because you have a two-point maximum principle and you have to coordinate your second variation at one point exactly with the second variation at the other point so that you get the cancellations that you need to get the information that you want. Okay. I have seven minutes or so, so let me <clears throat> just briefly say a few consequences of uh, this uh, non-collapsing result and this is a Euclidean, yeah. So, uh, right, so what are extensions? So, Simon, so there's, uh, let, me, let me first give one consequence, right? So consequence, consequences. So the uh, uh, one consequence is that you can prove a certain uh, gradient estimate, which is, um, <clears throat> which is better. So there's a Haselhofer Kleiner used the non-collapsing assumption. You, you now have a you know you have a quantitative way to exploit embeddedness, and it's you have the same quantitative parameter alpha all the time. And they, they prove the gradient estimate. So if M and T intersect with a large ball, radius 2R, around some point x naught, is smooth on some interval, say T naught minus uh, 4R squared up to T naught. So the interval somehow fits in size uh, to the ball, and alpha non-collapsed. So you have this estimate that the inscribed radius is bigger than alpha on H. Then <coughs> Mn T intersected with the smaller ball around X naught on the smaller time interval satisfies a gradient bound on the second fundamental form where the constant just depends on n and the non-collapsing constant and here you get um, times the second fundamental form squared at the same point in time. Now that's an important estimate which allows you to control the gradient of the curvature, not just in terms of the maximum of the curvature, what we did before, such an estimate we did very early in the beginning, but it allows you to control the gradient of curvature at the same point where you know the curvature. And that allows you to do our rescaling procedure, which I showed you, not just in those points where I'm close to the maximum of the curvature. I can now rescale anywhere. I can rescale anywhere I want inside the flow because my gradient estimate is perfectly adjusted to the size of the curvature at that point. Yeah? And it's amazing that the non-collapsing condition, which is sort of lower order, gives you such strong information here. So that was one <coughs> consequence. And then there have been extensions. So there, in particular, there is a theorem by Simon Brentle. I think 2016, where he showed that not only is, like in Ben Andrews' theorem, the constant alpha preserved, but the alpha improves 
as time goes on, or in other words, the upper bound on mu over h improves. So in fact, he can show that for any eta, there exists a constant c, depending just on eta, the initial alpha, and the initial surface, such that mu is bounded from above by 1 plus eta times h plus c of eta. Plus, plus this c. Which means that if we are in a rescaling procedure where the mean curvature blows up, we, this is fixed, this is as small as we want, so we can make this like 1 plus 2 eta h, so in the limit we get mu less than h. Any rescaling limit has mu less than 1 times h. On the other hand, mu is the inverse of the inside radius. So obviously, simply by staring at it, uh, all the principal curvatures are less than mu. Right? The curvatures have to be smaller than one over the radius um, of the biggest ball that's inside. So <coughs> this tells you, for example, if you, uh, right, and so in the one dimensional case, this means immediately if n equals 1, this means that mu less than h means uh, you are on a round circle. So for convex curves, this is another proof of Grayson's theorem. But he would need convexity because it's positive mean curvature. So this, if, if you're on a circle, this satisfies this, this uh, if, if, if you're in a one-dimensional case, this tells you that you're on the circle. Also, it tells you if you are on a two-dimensional surface, which has one straight direction, so a two-dimensional, so n equals two, <coughs> a cylinder <coughs> with h with mu less than h must be axially symmetric. Because one direction doesn't contribute to the mean curvature, so you're essentially down to your cross section, and the cross section is round. So this gives you a cylindrical estimate for mean curvature flow. So you can interpret in the two dimensional case. This estimate of Simon Brentle, this theorem here, is a cylindrical estimate that tells you that whenever you have a rescaling of a singularity of mean curvature flow, and it has one straight direction, then the other direction must circle up, must, must be round. And this gives, gives us now a chance to classify all the singularities of mean curvature flow for positive mean curvature for embedded surfaces in the two-dimensional case. So <clears throat> as an upshot of this result, we get that embedded positive mean curvature solutions M2 sitting in R3 can only have these singularities, namely the sphere, which I showed you, the round cylinder, and this translating bowls which near infinity look like shrinking cylinders. allowed surgery and so on um, there. And then, in fact, 
all these things can be extended to Riemannian manifolds. This part. Also this part, yeah. But I mean, the reflection over there, I'll, I'll The reflection you have, well, you see, you, have, you only need it, of course, when I say it extends, it doesn't extend exactly, but with error terms. But you can extend it in such a way that if you are in a region of high curvature, where the distances are very small, that you can do the reflection with the help of the exponential maps oh. and, and x. Ah, okay. Yeah, because you only need this locally. I see, I see. And then you can use the exponential map to mimic the reflection. Yeah, because you just need these eyes and the other Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's a good point to stop.